always feel as though I am, um, I have been very politely welcomed into the community of Indian Ocean scholars. All right. Because I'm really a West Africa scholar, <laughs> uh, to be frank, uh, but also Islamic Africa. Uh, I have uh, studied different communities. I'm very active with the Sahara Crossroads Initiative. But through a very strange side door, I got involved in Indian Ocean studies by studying Madagascar. And uh, by studying Madagascar, I became more and more interested in the Indian Ocean. And I say uh, uh, very fortunate because I have found all the scholars of uh, the Indian Ocean, like Gwen Campbell, Pierre Larson, uh, and now I've just been my always to have been very hospitable and to really reflect the kind of uh, scholarly exchange that in my experience is very typical of African studies uh, as well. So um, I am going to approach this from a whole different uh, point of view. I'm going to look at the years between the late 18th century and the mid 19th century. And my goal is to incite you to think of ways to approach your own research and teaching. I'm from a small liberal arts college, Lafayette, uh, which uh, has this uh, focus on what they call uh, scholar teachers. So we, I have to say, um, even since I've been there, really learned a lot and appreciated my colleagues' different points of view about teaching. So I've tried to put a little bit of that in my perspective of my talk. Um, I'm hoping to get you excited about the subject and excited about ways that you can present it. I'm not going to insist on names of kings or explorers <laughs> or complete lists of commodities for any given port. But rather, I want to give you sound information regarding the relationship of East Africa to the rest of the Western Indian world during a particular period. And as was said earlier, the readings that I've given you are really just windows into this period. I'm sure by now you can see the topic is huge. And by some strange aberration in our educational system, we don't find out about it until very late. And the same thing is true for African studies. I mean, Africa is an enormous continent. There's no way that we can cover anything but a, a little, a very small perception of, of what was going on in East Africa in relationship to the Indian Ocean world. But I, I will say that um, this is a period where, I, I love this period, it's very interesting. It's at a time when pirates were finally pushed out of the region. Privateers gradually gave way to state-sponsored corporations like the VOC, which we were just talking about. Individual explorers and traders gave way to colonial officers. And local and regional networks in the Western Indian Ocean were complicated with added commercial and maritime linkages to Europe, West Africa, New England, the Caribbean, and Brazil, which we just uh, went over, so I'm glad we can link right back into that. As you know now, the history of migrations of people, animas, and even flora in the Indian Ocean constitute an important chronicle of the making of the modern world. What I'm going to try to do is break up the topic of East Africa and the Western Indian Ocean into sections that highlight somewhat of what I think are salient elements of the story and to sharpen your curiosity about this aspect of the Western Indian Ocean. So for a third of my talk, I'm going to stay on this website. I thought about doing um, uh, slides, but I thought my slides are not going to be better than this website. <laughs> I will be able to prove to people that I know how to do slides, but when, I'm just going to uh, deal with this website, which is so good. Um, now, going back through history, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm going to read from this so I don't miss anything, and I hope I'm not too boring. I promise not to just continue reading. But um, I'm going to talk about slavery and commerce. Um, or perhaps I could talk about slavery in commerce, or I could say commerce 
via slavery. Uh, but these two uh, factors are so tied together. And um, I don't know how much experience you've had in teaching about slavery, but I, as I even say to some colleagues, we have to try to imagine in the 10th century what people thought they were talking about when they were saying slavery. Uh, we could say, and I don't mean to be an apologist, but people could say, you know, people suffered. Everybody was suffering. I mean, very few people were not suffering. So I think that in many cases, uh, people thought that slavery was like the worst labor contract you could get. Okay, they, they thought they sold people into a labor contract. What we think of as slavery... Uh, many historians, including Gwyn Campbell and others, have come to call unfree labor because it presents itself differently at different times and in different places. Americans tend to uh, pr project plantation slavery that uh, is a, a big part of American history. Um, we tend to think of very big, we have a very specific sort of trope in our minds of a big plantation and a certain type of division of cultures that actually wasn't even true in our own country, much less elsewhere. So um, it is very important to understand that slavery presents differently both in different places and at different times in history. And uh, if one thing is uh, very characteristic of African studies today, is a very uh, dynamic uh, dialogue that's happening between people who work on the African continent and people who work on different African diasporas. And part of that reason is the internet and the evolution of a much bigger community of scholars that now includes uh, African scholars who went to school in Europe, um, sorry, Asian scholars who are working on the Indian Ocean, so much bigger community which requires us to be more uh, expansive and also more rigorous uh, in our scholarship. So, there's evidence of slavery prior to the advent of Islam as we know the Roman period under the Persians. And archaeology and other scientific research has proposed the exchange of people and goods between the Arabian Peninsula, the East African coast, Malaysia and Indonesia, and islands such as the Comoros and Madagascar. However, it is with the expansion of Islam and the movement of peoples and goods that came with that expansion of the pace of slavery in the Indian Ocean that made uh, a greater uh, exchange of culture and goods. The African slave trade of the Western Indian Ocean likely moved as many people from Africa as did the Atlantic slave trade. But there are very important differences, and this is what I want to discuss. The Indian Ocean trade lasted longer, even though in terms of volume, the numbers are comparable to the Atlantic slave trade. That it lasted longer suggests that it may not have induced the same trauma on a local scale that characterized local life along the Atlantic, but this is not sure. So. Uh, in in uh, gross terms, you could say that that slave trade lasted twice the amount of time as the Atlantic slave trade, but with the same number of people. So right away, you can see you didn't have the same wrenching of huge numbers of people from one part of the world to the other. Another uh, difference is that uh, many people were still being transported from the East African interior to the Arab states and to Mauritius and sometimes India up to the turn of the 19th century. So Ned Alpers, for example, uh, has done a lot of work on Mozambicans in India and people who were taken right at the turn of the century who could still remember something about being from Mozambique. The Indian Ocean trade began earlier than the Atlantic slave trade, as I said. You could go back to the 8th century uh, but you could also remember that a lot of the Swahilis, and I'll get back to this later, claim a Persian origin. So let's say we could go back to the Persian and Roman empires. Uh, and then afterwards, with the spread of Islam in the ninth century, sailors and explorers from the Arab Gulf 
are believed to have traveled along the eastern coast of Madagascar and settled on the Comoros Islands, which, of course, that word comes from Arabic al Kamarun, the moon, the moon islands, because they form a sort of a crescent. I don't know if I can go back and forth here. Let's try. Oh, they don't even put by the poor little islands there. They're too, <laughs> they're too small. I'll have to do another search. But anyway, um, the Comoros Islands were an important stopover for refurbishing ships, uh, for people to rest for health reasons, uh, and for supplies and foodstuffs. So cattle, um, fruits, and actually um, many spices were transported to the Comoros Islands. So for some, they didn't go all the way to the Spice Islands. The Comoros Islands became like a western outpost of the Spice Islands. So nutmeg and vanilla. And ilang-ilang later, which is used for perfume, uh, were very important in the Comoros um, economy. And interestingly, uh, there's a very big tie between of this part of the world and the United States that I want to go into, which may be interesting in your teaching. There's a very close tie between New England and the Western Indian Ocean. And one of the ways that started in the mid 18th century uh, was with whaling. So, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Swahili. I just feel like I can't possibly have the nerve to come in here and talk about East Africa and the Indian Ocean without talking about the Swahili, even though my focus has been on Madagascar. I have traveled to Lamu. I do uh, know a little bit about, um, about the Swahili. They're thought to have originated from an intermixture of Arab and East African and Persian cultures and people. The earliest Swahili populations are thought to have developed in the course of exchange between what was in Persia and people living along the East African littoral. Later in the ninth century, of course, you have other descent groups who came from Oman. Uh, but some scholars think that um, Monomotapa, which was the Zimbabwe state, was at the origin of the exchange with Persia because they have found that uh, the Zimbabwe kingdom was exporting gold. So um, some people have suggested, some scholars have suggested that the Swahili people are actually an evolved international community that came from uh, Persians coming down along the East African coast and people who migrated um, eastwards to trade with the Persians and, uh, they think, pastoralists, uh, people who travel with cattle, who were living in the plains on the eastern side of the mountains. So they occupy the islands along the eastern littoral uh, we're talking about Lamu, Zanzibar, Pemba, Mafia, etc. And I am going to try to get another picture because I think we should be able to see um, the Comoros Islands. And also, I want to um, encourage you to to ask me questions. It's uh, I think it'll make uh, my talk more interesting. We've all been sitting already for a while. Okay, uh, Swahili culture is largely urban, and I would suggest that it probably grew from a dependence on slaves enslaved for agricultural labor. Swahili, Swahili architecture dating from the 8th century onward also attests to this. Um, Archaeologists have found Swahili ruins even on the east coast of Madagascar, as well as in the Comoros, and mostly the Swahili lived in urban settings because they lived in a maritime economy, much like what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Um, the use of slaves in this economy was not basically or primarily for agriculture, but for labor on the docks labor to repair boats, uh, and everything that had to do with the maritime economy. But this is very key to uh, the identity of the Swahili because the Swahili are a particular cultural group and even ethnic group 
uh, including the people, if you will, in the Comoros, who genetically have a background sometimes uh, from further east in the Indian Ocean, or what we're calling Indonesian, uh, Arab, Persian, uh, in quotes, Bantu, African, uh, but you wouldn't say that they have an Arab influence because they've been like this for a thousand years. That's like saying Americans have a British influence. That may be true, but Americans are Americans, and so I would argue to the same extent the Swahili are the Swahili. They're not trying to be like Arabs. That's really who they are. Um, and so they organize themselves according to different descent groups, and so certain islands have a close relationship to a Persian history, and other islands like Zanzibar uh, were taken over by of the royal family of Oman and relate closer to the Omani. And I wanted then to talk a little bit about women in these uh, societies because unlike the Atlantic slave trade, the East Indian sl slave trade as well as the Maghrebian slave trade were characterized by the movement of women. And the relationship of the presence of women and how they functioned in these economies has to do with a growing surplus uh, and expendable money and consumer habits, actually, you could even say. Now, Swahili women have diverse professions. I want to go into that just a little bit. Uh, they are wife and mother, but not unlike their counterparts in other Muslim regions of Africa, uh, gendered labor relies on multiple actors in any given household. The role of the Muslim African woman has to always be seen in the context of the extended family. Women's roles include mother, in-law, aunt, sister, daughter, grandmother, niece, etc. And each one of these roles has a different social etiquette and responsibility. So it's not like we have in a nuclear family you have the mother and the father, and then you have machines to get stuff done. In these societies, you have the mother and the father, the older daughters who are doing work, a niece who may have come to live with them, and servants. And as the Western Indian Ocean economy grew, then the demand for servants also grew because there were more people uh, who could spend money, pretty much. And most of the slaves that circulated from the East African coast were women. They went to work in Arab and in, uh, well, particularly in the Arab world, to work in households as household labor. Um, and I, as I just said, women's leisure increased with the increased dependence on servile women who are outside of the original kin network. So in other words, the work that needed to be done uh, throughout the Islamic world, particularly in North Africa and the Indian Ocean, you don't want to bring strangers into your household. So what people, uh, in terms of male strangers, and yes, people did have eunuchs, but more often people brought in slave women who would uh, interact with the women of the family. Swahili states became primary nodes of the Western Indian Ocean commercial networks that extended to the East African coast and beyond. So they were middlemen for the gold hides, leather hides, which were very important. Um, some of the more exotic things like rhinoceros tusk or ivory that were coming out of the, um, out of continental East Africa and then passed through the Swahili to the Indian Ocean trade. And um, when I was in Kenya January, uh, year before last, I ran into a couple of anthropologists who were there. And it's very interesting uh, the kind of fear that some of the populations in East Africa developed of the Swahili over time because the Swahili almost seemed like a sort of a magical people who uh, ran the Dows and who took people away who never came back and who were even uh, considered to have a lot of magical power that they can sort of uh, 
mesmerize people into doing what they want. And in fact, in East Africa, a lot of those communities on the mainland provide agricultural commodities for the Swahili because the Swahili are not big farmers. They're sailors. They're city dwellers. So they have to work with uh, the farmers who are of other ethnic groups along the coast in order to get agricultural commodities and staples. So in terms of the working with the farmers and then also dealing with slave trade, were they cautious to segregate which communities they were taking people from? That's a very good question because you don't want to sell all your farmers right. and you're you going to be scared, hungry. You don't want to scare, <laughs> scare people off from dealing with you. Yeah, I think it has to do with uh, Islamization. Uh, which communities became their affines, their in-laws, so to speak, their allies. And of course, those communities then turn around and help them plunder the other uh, communities. So that's a very good question. You're absolutely right. You wouldn't want to sell your own agricultural labor out. <laughs> now, I, I also, I'll just say that you probably know that it's it's very different in terms of other types of um, networks that went to like Gujarat and Hyderabad because there are um, studies that show a lot of people came from Mozambique to those areas as well as Ethiopia. In fact, when you were, were talking, Mike, I was uh, fascinated because Ethiopia was also known as Little India uh, to some extent. So. Um, who, it, I think one of the problems is the vocabulary that's still being used when we talk about some of these things. For me, to read something and they say, the Ethiopians were also slaves in India, I'm like, which ones? <laughs> you know, because there was a very brisk slave trade out of Ethiopia. But there are different ethnic groups and there are different dynasties in Ethiopia. So I would assume that one dynasty took over a territory and was sending people out from somewhere else uh, to India. So there's that history as well, which is a little bit different. You may know that um, Africans in India are known as Sidi, or as Arabic Habash, uh, Habshi. Uh, these are words that uh, circulated throughout the Western Indian Ocean to indicate someone of African uh, descent and Habshi in particular uh, developed in uh, reference to Ethiopians. But which Ethiopians we're talking about, I don't know. Well, and do you get a concept kind of like you have with the Moors? You know, that that word could just Ethiopia of course. becomes. Yeah. Yes, but it, I, I think it's also the further away you get. But when you're right there at yeah. the Gulf, people definitely know the difference between mm -hmm. an Ethiopian, say, and a Somali. Mm -hmm. Point because they've all been interacting for the same amount of time that we were talking about. If you go back, look at this map. You see people were coming right down from Yemen to uh, Kenya, you see the little islands here, and uh, joining Swahili communities. The same thing um, for the Oman people who came down uh, to Tanzania and took over Zanzibar much later. The Persians came much earlier. But you also have, in addition to that, adventurers, if you will. You know, we tend to think that only the Westerners were adventurers, which I think is a, an epistemological <laughs> error. So, and so you have uh, adventurers who left Ethiopia and uh, worked as mercenaries. There's a very long history of uh, Ethiopian soldiers in Western India. Um, and you also have uh, people who worked on ships as sailors. So you can't say all of the Africans who went to uh, the Western Indian Ocean were moving around as slaves. It's, it's never been the case. Mm -hmm. It's always been that um, that characterizes a certain trade for a certain time, but there were also people who were simply sailors or who were working as soldiers. And in fact, and, and we'll look at this on the website, there are two or three dynasties that were created or taken over by Ethiopians in Western India that lasted several hundred years. Um, one of the other things that um, I want to show is that
Well, the Comoros, as I said, are too little to be in this picture, but here's Zimbabwe. So here, theoretically, is the source of the gold that I was making reference to. And uh, probably the plains that are available here are not available further up because of the mountainous uh, regions that characterize East Africa. So what people postulate is that the Swahili developed as a separate ethnic group because of trade. Uh, earlier with the Persians and then several hundred years later with the Omani. <coughs> uh, let me get back to my notes here. Uh, Swahili states, in addition to the trade in copal and hides, which were the major products of this region, uh, had maritime skills in navigation, boat building and repair, and port management. So does anybody here know what copal is? It's semi-fossilized resin. That's right. <laughs> it's sort of like amber. Right. It's like younger amber. Um, and it's very important in terms of the relationship of this country to the Indian Ocean, and, and we'll get to that later. But copal was very important in shipbuilding. How is it spelled? C-O-P-A-L. It was very, very important because it's used to condition wood like shellac. So before the United States had access to the pine forests and we were producing kerosene and all the different oils that came from the cotton industry and uh, moving further west into Tennessee and other places where there was a lot of pine uh, forest production, copal was extremely important in the United States. So uh, all of these skills and commodities were interwoven with the production of slaves. Slaves were produced by interstate warfare, personal or individual debt, and by kidnapping. Generally speaking, those who engendered the local conditions for the production of captives, soldiers, military leaders, royal personalities, or money lenders were not the ones who organized the long distance trade. Captives were brought from the areas of Mozambique, particularly the Makonde, from the interior of Kenya's coastal lands, and sometimes from afar, by merchant caravans that also sought forest and savanna products like elephant tusks, honey, and copal. And I'm, I'm going to talk later about how do we talk about this with uh, students in high school or in different levels. Every once in a while I do, in addition to having my own uh, young people in my household, I also <laughs> have uh, taught or uh, participated in different projects at high schools. Captives were brought to the coast and then sold to specialized merchants who knew the various markets, whether along the coast or long distance markets to Iran, India, Yemen, etc. So uh, the luxury uh, always depended uh, on certain costs. In other words, how close are you to who is creating the surplus in question. Uh, it, you, the people who are living off of the surplus that allows them to get all the latest things from the caravans and the silk and the gold and the latest food and, I don't know, lace from France. Those people were not near where the slaves were being produced. They're, they're just part of the system. The slaves are way off someplace else. So we're talking about people pulling slaves out of here and here. And then bringing them to these islands, basically. Bringing them to these islands. And then from the islands being shipped again to other networks. Now in addition to that, there was quite a lot going on between Madagascar um, and the Comoros and East Africa. And they just raided each other on a regular basis. So the Swahili traded with, I, in fact, most of my research has been about Majunga, or Mahajanga as it's known, uh, which was a, a very important trade area in Madagascar, again because of the winds, the monsoons, there's only a certain way that you can profitably go around Madagascar. Uh, 
So on the on the east side here, uh, this was what was called the Pirate Coast. This is where you had a lot of pirates in the 18th um, century in particular, and when pirates were driven from the Caribbean, this is where they went, really? most of them, to the Indian Ocean. Very interesting stories of Thomas Tew, T-E-W. Kevin McDonald just put out a book about Madagascar and the pirates. So one great hook about studying about this part of the world is the pirates. It's just fantastic and leads you right to New York City. Um, right to New York City. So the pirates uh, stayed here at this little, this little place here is Ile Saint Marie or St. Mary's Island. And the book that I just um, uh, I'm going to put out, which comes out in October, uh, part of that book is, that I did is about slaves that were sent in a sort of a strange aberration from the northeast coast of Madagascar to Virginia, where they were sort of an exotics. Um, so this, this is the 17th century and the 18th century. The French came here, I think, about uh, 1740. The first uh, Jesuits, I believe, were in this area. However, in the 19th century, Majunga was a major port for New England traders. And you'll re recognize the names of Peabody, um, Pingree, uh, uh, the Schuyler family, uh, relatives of the Roosevelts, as in Franklin Delano, the Delanos. All of these people were big New England traders. And the Americans were very aggressive in the Indian Ocean because the British had to let them in. That's why we had the Tea Party. The British would not let them into the Indian Ocean. So every time that the Americans wanted to buy cotton, as you know, or any other Indian Ocean products, they had to buy from the British. So as soon as the Revolutionary War was over, those guys said, let's do it. And out they went, and they took over Zanzibar, and which even the British could not get in to Zanzibar and Mauritius for 150 years. The, the Americans were so successful uh, in controlling, not Mauritius, I want to say Majunga. And of the boats that went to Mauritius, which is right over here somewhere, most of them were American. So from 1790 right up to the Civil War, uh, Americans really controlled uh, this trade. So we have a, a lot of interesting history that isn't always, uh, which we have forgotten, which probably was so commonplace at the time that nobody ever thought it would disappear. And now uh, we don't think about it. So uh, anyway, Swahili merchants and Gujarati merchants in Swahili states sold Indian cotton to American merchants who also came to buy hides and copal. They also created their own spheres of influence and competed with British interests in other ports such as Cape Town and Gujarat itself. Um, I'm going to just sort of go through here. So, um, agriculture was not extensive or ex consistently practiced, of course, in the Arabian Gulf area, though there was a demand for slave labor for date production as there was in the Maghreb. Uh, if you, for instance, ever study Sudan, you know that slaves were very important in water management in the Sudan, extremely important, because they were the ones who stayed in the oases and made sure the sakara, the water wheel, was managed correctly. So all of these areas are like oases in a way because they have this concentrated organization of labor that is not based on big land use, but rather on managing trade or very specialized products like dates. Where were the dates generally? Oh, well, for that? All over the place? All, without that, throughout that region, I mean, Algeria, Egypt, Turkey. Okay. Iraq, what we call Iraq today, all of that area, there were people producing dates and there has been some research
Uh, for example, on Isfahan, um, where they show that uh, African slaves were brought into parts of Iran uh, to also support the, uh, agri the agricultural economy. And what was, uh, e what was Africa uh, exporting? As we said, ivory, gold, and eventually slaves uh, became the more important commodity. And the importance of slaves, uh, I think, really is tied to the Portuguese also, and uh, opening up of Brazil. <clears throat> and there are these flukes, like in Timor, Mauritius presents another fluke, where West Africans somehow got caught up in this network and sent all the way over to Mauritius in the east, in the Western Indian Ocean. There were actually people from Senegal and Ghana who got caught and taken all the way east to the Mauritius and the Seychelles. Uh, generally just because they were Dutch ships or British ships who were stopping along the way there and, and took them. I used to have a daycare when I had four toddlers in the house and so I can't beat them, join them. <laughs> right. And one of the uh, families that was in my daycare was a family from the Gambia and um, this young girl, the baby, the child, had the most gorgeous, like, caramel colored eyes. She had a Dutch grandfather and a Chinese grandfather and, you know, family from, of indigenous Gambians. Wow. And, you know, I mean, amazing, right? Yeah, it's, that, it's those, uh, those ports, the ports, yeah. and certainly Madagascar. The people look like they're what they are historically, a mixture of Indonesians and Africans, and in some cases, Arabs. Uh, in this area here, there are a group of people called the Antalaot, um, who are a mixture that really represents the way trade was moving. They are a mixture of, of um, Yemeni, Omani, uh, Western, uh, probably Gujarat, and Malgash, and Swahili. And they're the traders. Antalaota means people of the sea. And in fact, that's who they, they were. They operated out of Majunga. Uh, they, were, they had to report to the, the king. Madagascar had a very stratified, hierarchical society. So in the center of Madagascar, I don't know how much you've already talked about Madagascar. No, no, bitch. Okay, just let me know because I don't want to like say no, something you've already done not again. You know? <laughs> not the matter, not again. Everyone's giving a different, you know. Okay, headline, good. So. so the center of Madagascar, um, the people are called the Merina, M-E-R-I-N-A. But Madagascar in general uh, is about two thousand. Has been populated for about two thousand years. People are not sure exactly what happened. At one point they said that the people from East Africa and the people from Indonesia all traveled to Madagascar and met there. But linguistic evidence now shows that the people who became the Malagasy actually uh, mixed with the, in quotes, Bantu people somewhere on the east coast of Africa. And then they decided that they were a little different and they prefer to move to another place and they moved to Madagascar. So Madagascar, the original Malagasy people, uh, although in Madagascar they say there were some original people called the Vazimba, a sort of um, the pygmies or the original indigenous group, that is more folkloric. There is not yet any um, a sufficient uh, genetic or archaeological history to go with that folklore yet. What's the distance geographically? Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. So um, I could, we could look it up, but I can tell you. And just a rough comparison to something. Well, the, the scale, it's probably the from... 100 miles in the corner there. Oh, thank you. You're probably talking from Baja, California to Seattle. Huh? Okay. Yeah, and out to Nevada. Remember, the continent of Africa is more than three times the size of the United States. It's hard to... We don't see that image very often. So. That old Mercator map. Yeah, right. but just exactly. it's hard to... 
So um, there, there are also successive waves of people arriving to Madagascar, which should not uh, surprise us. And even on the Kenyan coast, uh, they have now found China, Chinese pottery from the ninth century. So another trope that we're laboring under is isolated Africa. Hmm. Part of the problem is that why would we think of Africa, why would Africans all speak to each other? I mean, that's a huge place. It's not easy to travel. Right, just like we were talking about the Moors, there really were no Africans. Africans were in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Africans were Salahili, Hausa, Fulbe, Sudania, Amharic. There was no Africa. What Africa what? So um, the other thing is that people say, well, the Africans only went inside. They didn't travel outside. But if you think of Americans, we have a really big country. One reason a lot of Americans don't go overseas is because they're still trying to learn America. <laughs> so that's sort of the same truth of people from the continent of Africa. It's so huge. Let's take um, something that I know by heart. Let me just show you up the button. I guess not. Let's just say that from, from here, Tanana Reef to Majunga is about six hours on a good road. You see, it's, um, it's very hard to, to imagine, really. So uh, this area here did get waves of Arab settlers. There is a sacred text uh, in Madagascar called Sorabe. And Sorabe is a way of writing Malagasy with Arabic letters. Mm -hmm. And most of the Malagasy kings had scribes who were Arabs or descendants of Arabs in their particular ethnic groups in Madagascar, uh, not just the Antalotra, but um, the Antemoro, and a few others who have direct descent and uh, demonstratedly have some link to Arab culture. And they also have these very old uh, forts and houses like you see in the Swahili states. But in the case of Madagascar, they seem to have melted away into the population and you just find um, uh, occasional uh, elements. For example, the market is called Juma. The market of Friday is called the Juma. And everybody um, uses that term in spite of what other sub-ethnic groups they may be from. So uh, the first state, which was the Buena state, uh, people marched around here and uh, took over this region from the other people who were mostly cattle herders. And I guess we're talking about, it must be about 900, I would say, 850, 900. They then moved up uh, around 1200, continued up the island to Majunga. And the culture of Madagascar is very mixed with uh, uh, Indonesian practices, they say, from Sumatra and Java. There's a lot of animism. There is a lot of uh, importance for ancestors. And then it is fused with Bantu practices. So spirit possession is very, very important in Madagascar. And there are very stylized ways that people uh, practice um, this uh, spirit possession. For example, uh, in this area, in Majunga, the royal, the nobles, uh, cannot themselves get possessed, but other people can get possessed by nobles who have died. So these people then act out the personality of the past king or the past queen or the past princess, and there's also a strong culture of sacred objects. Um, Isn't a lot of that true in Zimbabwe as well? The, the possession aspect, I think. Well, generally, I don't know about Zimbabwe, but today um, any kind of possession is considered a marker of probable African influence. Uh -huh. And so that you can find possession cults uh, 
uh, what do they call them in Morocco? Um, Morocco? Ganawa. You know, the Ganawa are uh, a group of Moroccans of captive descent, and they have a tradition of possession and healing. Mm -hmm. In um, Tunisia and Algeria, it's called um, Istanbul, from Istanbul, mm -hmm. because of the fact that at that time the, the Turks uh, controlled Tunisia. They call it Stambuli. They have it in uh, Iran, Zar. It's called in many Arabic uh, countries yeah. in the Gulf, Zar. And what uh, social anthropologists and historians now think is whenever you see that Zab, or whatever you call it, it's, sh it's like a marker for some kind of uh, interaction with Africans. Mm -hmm. That's Brazil. Ma Ma uh, Santeria. Yeah, Santeria. Mm -hmm. um, and the Baptist Church. These are all manifestations of some kind of a core uh, value in, in African cultures. Mm -hmm. In, in Egypt, I lived in a village in the Delta where I married my husband, and um, the women would sometimes attend the czar, and oh, you know, yeah. it was typical that you know, the young men and women who came back from college in the city would tell their aunts and sisters, and you know, like, don't, 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 don't do this stuff there. with the czar, that's like not Islamic and whatnot. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's very itchy because it's just like we were hearing about for Indonesia, there's a lot of syncretism mm -hmm. in this region, and people are not uncomfortable with having very fluid identities and very fluid practices. So what you find in Africa, for example, and I hate to say Africa, right. you know, <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean, uh, is that um, a lot of the animistic uh, beliefs are put into the um, category of genies. So ontologically, all of those spirits and things become genies. Different areas have genies that you have to be careful of. Crossroads have genies. And so it's just a, a remodeling of the vocabulary. So um, you will find that there are archaeological remains of Chinese and Arab and Indian products. And then you have whole ethnic groups that evolved, you can almost say, in response to these trade routes, like the Antala Otra, who were these middlemen, who are mixed Indian, Arab, and Swahili. And then you had, uh, the, what, as I was saying, this kind of um, conflict because the Comoros would raid Madagascar for slaves. Madagascar would raid Comoros for slaves. And Madagascar especially took slaves from Mozambique um, for their local economy. And now getting back to your question about what happens when you start selling your own farmers. This was eventually the pro problem that Madagascar had. Uh, in the 1600s, uh, so you had, I'm sorry, I should have said, you have this dynasty here, you have a related dynasty up here of the same language group, the Sakalava people. But then, uh, around 1500, you have another dynasty growing up, which is the um, Merina. And I, you know, we all were talking about different types of debates that come up in different fields of study. So one of the real thorny questions when you're talking about Madagascar is, are the people in the center more pure um, Asian? And the people, and this becomes very political and messy in Madagascar itself. And are the people on the on the uh, coasts uh, more African or more Arab? more mixed, more impure. Well, actually, linguistics tells us that the Malagasy that's spoken along the coast is actually the oldest Malagasy. So what, what probably happened is that since people were already uh, inhabiting these regions, new arrivals had to go inland. But if you go inland to Madagascar, uh, you will find that it looks very much like Indonesia. There's terraced rice farming, a wetland rice farming. Um, they also have possession, but they have a sort of a mass possession that used to take place with their queen. Um, they did have these uh, 
sacred objects made out of silver. I think there's probably a whole slew of doctorates hint, hint, that could be done uh, with people looking at the traits from Indonesia in Madagascar. It, it, it's really quite profound. So linguistically, uh, it's really tied into the culture. It's not something that looks like a layer. It's who the people actually are. So they would bring in slaves from Mozambique for their own agricultural use. But as time went on, by the 1600s, back to the good old VOC, people started responding to trade opportunities in Cape Town. So you have a whole uh, series of exports of people as slaves from southwestern Madagascar to Cape Town. So some of the people that are thought of or referred to as Malays in uh, Cape Town were actually Malagasy's. But they were also taken in the other direction um, by the Dutch and many Malagasy were taken to Indonesia to work in pepper plantations. And I guess it was easier to bring Malagasy because their language was would have taken maybe three weeks to speak the local language because the language of, of Madagascar is uh, Austronesian. It's not an African language. It's an Austronesian language with African uh, Bantu vocabulary. <laughs> but it's not a Bantu language. So uh, quite a number of slaves from Madagascar were sent eastwards uh, to work uh, in the pepper fields. Uh, that became, of course, more important in the 17th and 18th century because of the presence of the Portuguese, because of new demands, because of new consumer habits. Um, let's see. Before you proceed, um, you said the, the Cape Malays are Malays from Madagascar? Some of them are, okay, yes. I thought it was from... Some of them are Malaysian. Oh, okay, okay. But in terms of the actual historicity, if you were to do a more detailed study, what you find is that in fact it was perhaps to some people more prestigious to say I'm a Malay than to say I'm Malagasy. And so many Malagasy look like they were Malaysian, who knows? Uh, I mean, I collected stories here in the United States from families who claimed Malagasy origins. And in a couple of those stories, there is a, a confusion with people that they call Malays. And so I don't know whether they were Malays and they all came from Cape Town, or whether some of them were actually Malagasy who said they were Malays. And also, it's very interesting. Um, if you look at, for example, Mauritius, which had a later in, influx of Indian populations, which you'll read about with uh, uh, Richard Allen's uh, article that I put in there for you. Uh, people from India, of course, were really exploited um, for their labor in uh, Mauritius and Réunion, which are these islands off of the East African coast. A lot of times, um, these are people that the British sort of skimmed off the edges of uh, local societies, people who had been working on plantations for the British crown in India. And then they didn't even know where they were going sometimes. They didn't really have a clear idea where they were being taken to. But a lot of them were taken to Mauritius. And in Mauritius, uh, something like 40% of the slave population was from Madagascar. But they were considered lower on the social ladder. Probably that would not have happened if the Indians hadn't come in as contracted labor. And what were the slaves of Mauritius doing? Were they sugarcane plantations? Okay. Mauritius had no people. It was just a big rock in the ocean, <laughs> and then uh, the Dutch. Uh, founded, I think it was the Dutch or the Portuguese, I think it was the Dutch. Then the French moved in and they stayed there till the 1830s and then the British took over. 
and it was just used, it's often, uh, it, it's compared to, it's called the Caribbean of the Indian Ocean, so uh, students can really understand it if you compare it to Jamaica or Trinidad, their music is similar, Zouk, for those of you who like music, Zouk music, uh, very Creole culture, mixture of French, uh, British, and different African uh, streams uh, that, that you'll find there. Um, let's see. Let me see, there's a little bit more I want to say about... Uh, So long distance trade in slaves required the ongoing production of captives. And this is what happened in Madagascar. Unfortunately, the opportunity of Mauritius uh, really caused a, a rise in conflict within Madagascar as uh, the rules became more and more strict for free people. For example, if they fell into debt, then they had conscripted labor within Madagascar to build roads and things like that, and if people didn't show up one time, or they left too soon. I mean, there are all kinds of new reasons why people had to get shipped out to Mauritius. So uh, this kingdom grew and eventually um, attracted the British who wanted to stop, mainly because they wanted to stop the pirates. And uh, it, it's a very autocratic, uh, centralized Societies, the two major ones being the Merina and the Sakhalov, and then there, there are uh, three or four other large, the Betsy Misaraka, etc., etc. I mean, I'm just saying names, probably doesn't mean that much. But just to say that there are three or four major ethnic groups that had major dynasties, and um, when, the, uh, when the pirates were chased out, uh, Madagascar attracted strangely these uh, missionaries, of course the London Missionary Society because people were then going to India, but also Scottish architects. And so they built a new palace for the Queen in uh, the 1700s and uh, by 1790 up on the hill in Tananarive, you know, there are all these buildings made out of stone by Scottish architects. <laughs> So by 1820, there, there was a whole culture of Malagasy elites who were studying English and the Bible, uh, much to the chagrin of the queen. So the, the elites married each other, just like in Europe, like the Habsburgs or whoever, you know, the, the, the Medici. So people from one dynasty and people from another dynasty married each other. So among the elites, they all felt, well, we're all ru running Madagascar, uh, so to speak. And they were Christian? No, they were not. Oh. Okay. And in fact, this might be a, uh, something that makes it interesting to the students, Queen Rana Valona the I um, actually resisted the incursion of Christianity. And she kicked out all the Europeans. She kicked out all the missionaries. She said, we will not stop our traditional Malagasy ways of worshiping. Which was? Which was animism. And, and what, what uh, Westerners call ancestor worship, or ancestor veneration. Mm -hmm. And then there followed a terrible period of Christian martyrdom, because the Christians had to meet in caves or up in mountains to hide from the queen. Of course, you can see the big power struggle behind this story. It's interesting, there is no story like this with the Muslims. Because the world was different then. And the trade in the Indian Ocean was multi-sided, it was multifocal. As, as you've seen, there was Malacca, there was, you know, Gujarat, there these different places. But now, it's all getting, uh, pulled in the centrifugal force uh, regionally of South Africa with the VOC. And the West is rising through its relationship to these different systems. 
So um, she had a very different response for the Christians, and she killed hundreds of, Christ of Christians in Madagascar, and they had a big uh, movement of Christian martyrs who were uh, fighting to practice Christianity in the face of this violence from the queen, Queen Rana Valuna. When was this? This would be about 1830. It's a very big part, and this brought, of course, more Europeans who then um, were trying to uh, accept the, the people who were running away from Madagascar to create some place for them to go. So, um, I don't know how I'm going to my time We've got about here. eight minutes. Oh, um, Lord, how does well, that happen? Man, <laughs> we have this afternoon. Don't forget that we okay. have this afternoon. Let's look at this real fast, because I think this is... So, I use it in my classes. Actually, according to the schedule, we have until 12.15. Oh, okay, cool. So, so that means like, I don't know, 10, 15 great. minutes. Let's, let's go into this site. Come on. But like I said, we have what plenty happened? of time in the afternoon to continue discussion. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful website. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I felt that anything I would say would be really adding icing to the cake, and a very delicious cake indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we go to multimedia, there are many, many uh, short videos that you can use. I, I don't know if I've turned the sound off. I didn't mean to. Uh, uh, no, it's on. It should be on. Is it on? It should be. The music was playing before. Was playing right, and then I turned it off, and so, then... No, it seems to be on, but um, you're on the essays, I think, right now, and the images. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't multimedia. Yeah, let's look at this. You see it's... Maybe it's... I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Hold on, I think I think I have the secret here. Where is it? I think it is in here. Oh no, I think it's something that Susan, I Susan, don't... during your introduction, she turned it off on the yeah. yeah, it's here somewhere. Okay. It's here it was somewhere. Distracting. That's right, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to find how to get it back because the thing isn't coming back up. I saw you on the home page and you were hovering over it. Right. And but I was trying to get it wasn't responding. Yes, that's right, you yeah, agree. Uh, we can work on that at lunchtime and then play one at, at the end of lunch or during lunch even. Oh, isn't it crazy? Yeah, because like you're you're, you're on the me. you're on the browser right now. So we'll we'll do it at lunchtime. We'll, yeah. we'll get it up. Oh, too bad. Well we'll get it back, I promise. <laughs> Uh, but the thing is that um, it's a great aid, the students really love it, and they're all kinds of different, um, they, they, they divide it by sub-regions, so you can go to Palestine, you can go to Iran, you can go to Gujarat, and uh, many different places in the Western Indian Ocean region, and visit Afro uh, communities, Afro-descended communities of those different places. Um, and I'm, I don't know what happened to my sound here. Yeah, we'll get it back up. Okay, but as you can yeah, see, it's... there's East Africa, there's the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf, South Asia, and they interview people, they play music, they show Sufi musicians. Very, very interesting. So we'll get back to that uh, this afternoon. Um, in terms of the Indian Ocean slave trade, is there a gendered component to it? The same way that, um, I think you said something earlier about this. Yes. That the Atlantic slave trade, the Europeans want men. That's right. That, that's their conception. That's of the right. Labor. Mostly women in mostly, the Indian Ocean. So it, it is mostly women. It is mostly women. Well, especially that, that part that was part of the Islamic trade networks yeah. was mostly women. So did that yes. then change when the Europeans came in? Yes. They brought more men? They wanted, well, no. What happened is that it was no longer a slave trade that was controlled by Swahili's <coughs> or Indians. You know, because even when you go to the books, and I'm sorry, I didn't even have time. I was in Salem, Massachusetts in June looking through book uh, ship logs. Mm -hmm. 
and looking at captain's letters and diaries about their travels in Zanzibar and Majunga. And so what happens is that uh, these local, there were a lot of Gujarats living in Zanzibar as traders, but those people got put out of commission once the British and the Portuguese came. And of course, once the British came, they allowed slavery to continue for like 30 years, but there was a big abolitionist movement in England, but also they wanted to keep the labor there because they had other plans for those places and, and, and what they needed uh, from, from the people there. So once that turned again to agriculture, then there was a, a gender uh, turn, if you will, and people were looking for male slaves for so these. So growing clothes and vanilla yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that, and that came from the uh, Omanis, actually. The clothes, the British didn't want to mess with uh, the families of the sultans in Zanzibar. They didn't want to take a chance with that income. So there's some people that the British kind of left alone from 1800 to 1860, and that would include the royal family of Zanzibar, which is the sultan, which are related to the royal families in Oman, and the, and the Brazilians. Uh, they wanted sugar, so they made a special deal with the Brazilians and with the Cubans. So in, in both directions, and Mauritius, slavery continued until the 1860s. Uh, and of course, within East Africa and up to the Arab lands, right up to the turn of the century, 1920, uh, it continued. We've had a lot of discussion this week about the different types of slavery and the uh -huh. uh, conditions of slavery. Um, in the Indian Ocean, when you were taken as a slave and shipped somewhere far, it was basically lifetime chattel slavery, or was it a temporary condition more often? Everything. All of the above. Okay. Um, it also depends, for instance, like we were saying, some people worked on, a lot of people in this system were in the maritime system. They were working as dock workers and, and uh, ship repair people and, and things like that. So it depends on where and when. Towards the end of the slave trade, shameful, shameful human beings you know, most of the slaves were children. I mean, they ought to be ashamed of themselves and praying that they took slaves. Yeah. You know, in both directions, what you see in these old lithographs are boatloads of children that people have captured, uh, who they're hoping to mold into becoming pliant workers. So at that stage, when you're talking about the 1880s, 1870s, even 1860s in both directions, it's basically a boat full of 12-year-olds. But uh, earlier on, then you have other characteristics. And it depends. Of course, in Islamic tradition, many times uh, people were uh, integrated in as part of the kin network. Uh, I think one of the big differences is that um, in many cases in the Islamic world, there wasn't any discourse that the people were not human beings. That's the first difference. There wasn't this uh, big public discourse, well, you know, probably this isn't really a human being anyway, so it won't <laughs> feel it as bad. You know, that didn't exist. So, and also, dissent worked differently in that patrilineal society. So, the Arabs recognized kinship even if it is the child of a concubine. Mm -hmm. They said that is, oh, there goes Ismaila. He's the son of the concubine. But that's okay, because Ismaila knows who he is, the father knows who he is, and the whole community knows who he is. That's very different from the chattel slavery uh, in the Americas. And so even when we're looking and saying, well, why wasn't there a rebellion? There were some rebellions. In fact, Basra was uh, the location of a very big slave rebellion in what is today Iraq, and also in Iran. But more broadly speaking, there were fewer rebellions because people were more successfully integrated into these systems, even if they were on a lower rung, and they usually were. But there is also the case that very often uh, uh, Muslim elite men would uh, free their concubine, 
and, and take her as a wife. And, and that is all over the Islamic world. So there's some different, uh, there's some differences. And it, you know, it just depends on the, sometimes on the personality. You might have a Muslim king who doesn't want to follow any of that stuff. It really depends. They're very, very diverse. Um, in this website, you said it's uh, African cultures or communities in different areas? Yeah, African descended right. communities. Is, is there information about them today? Or? Yes, and in fact, if you are bored on a Sunday afternoon, it's, <laughs> you can go to YouTube. And uh, for instance, I, when I was working on my book, I wanted to do some comparison between the communities in Réunion and Mauritius because Madagascar has such a big emphasis on ancestors uh, and the fact that you mustn't forget that you have some descendants from Madagascar. So I went on YouTube and sure enough there were some young people from, Union, from Reunion dancing around saying, and we have ancestors from Madagascar. <laughs> and I went to Mauritius, there was a zoo group, and don't forget your ancestors from Madagascar. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. You can see a lot of interesting things. Um, when I'm teaching, I actually use YouTube a lot, and I'll tell you why. There's a really important credibility problem when you're talking about Africa. People just don't believe you. They just don't believe you. Or they think you're making this up because you like Africa. <laughs> or this is your opinion, but it's not fact. So when I'm teaching about Africa, I always go, I find pictures of Nairobi, I show Dakar, I show Dar es Salaam, I show Abuja, I show cars. <laughs> yes, because it's, it works much better than me talking. <laughs> and it will, in half an hour, it opens up a world to the students. And, oh my God, why didn't I know this? Why hasn't anybody told me this? So I really use YouTube a lot to help students. You can also go to weddings on YouTube. I sound like quite the voyeur, but you can go to weddings. You can go to you can go to um, Ganawa ceremonies in in in, um, in in Morocco, and you can go to weddings where people are dancing and singing and uh, all of that. And it really helps students see it's really true, you know, I find. Particularly with things that have to do with Africa because they haven't learned that much about it. And also Boston University has a great map that you can order called How Big is Africa? Yeah, yeah you know that one. And that's also uh, very useful. So I guess I only have like 12 minutes, but if there are any other questions or other things that I could uh, address more, and then the afternoon we'll find how to use this site better. Just a comment, you just mentioned the uprising in Basra, which I knew nothing about, and I remember an article that struck me right after the, uh, uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Uh, within weeks, two or three weeks, New York Times had a huge spread about this uh, very dark-skinned population in southern Iraq, the swamp and marshlands, and you know, persecuted under Saddam Hussein, and I, I you know, isn't that I, I, something? You know, okay, where did they come from? How did they get there? And you know, almost non-people to the Iraqi regime, but you know, living in their own societies and and and, and uh, you know, homes and villages. But um, you know, that's very uh, interesting. And a lot of times, I think people who were in the serv who were servants, really got displaced with colonialism. Either the colonialists tried to take them as their own labor force. See, you know, if you look at African history, the British and the French uh, told the, the local kings, this is bad slavery, it's terrible, stop that. And then two weeks later, they started conscripted labor. They got the same people with the slaves as forced labor. But in addition, when, when things turned again towards independence, some of the most reactionary people are the people who were the retainers of the royalty because that's their culture. And just like in Senegal, there was such a big uh, conflict with the Moors. And in the 19, about 1986, 1984, there were all these conflicts between Senegal and Mauritania. Uh, 
And at that time, uh, people did not like the Moors, the black Moors, the Moors who were a mixture of different Senegalese ethnic groups and uh, the Berber, Arabo-Berber uh, Mauritanians. But that is their culture. They develop a certain kind of, they're a liability. So I bet you they weren't always in the marshes. They were probably in, in those courts. Driven there. Right? And, yeah. 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 Two things that I'd like to share. Uh, you were saying about like the Islamic culture that, you know, oh, that's in the sun of this list. Mm -hmm. And in Islamic tradition, if you adopt, for example, you are not allowed to change the last name of the child, like in American culture. So that's why the lineage can be traced to whose son, what son, because the, the, the name remains. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I'd like to uh, share also that I've been very happy these past two days because I've heard from two scholars yesterday and now from you. Uh, for a long time, you know, since I lived in Washington, D.C., you know, I often saw the Ethiopian women, you know, many of them, compared with uh, African women from, let's say, West or mm -hmm. uh, Central Africa, their features, you know, look like Indian women, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I was wondering why Ethiopian, but uh, they have a, a dark skin, almost the same, but the features, Ethiopian women, they look more like Indian. Yeah. And then when I asked them, uh, do you have somehow Indian blood? They said, no, I am Ethiopian. So apparently they didn't know much about back then. But now it explained to me that the migration from Ethiopia to India, either through slave or through uh, adventure like soldiers uh -huh. or like that. So I'm very happy to know that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> And, and look at the geography. Look where Ethiopia is. Cross section. It's yeah. It's right there, receiving people for a very long time. The same thing with the Somalis. Of course, their of course their family social organization is like the Yemenis. Are you kidding me? Why wouldn't it be? Look where they are. Look at Yemen. It's just, you know. It's like Spain and, and Morocco. So uh, th these places have been interacting for a very very long time and sometimes we don't even know how long yeah that they have been um, interacting and also you would find the same thing if you were to see people from this area I was just talking with a gentleman from uh, the Smithsonian this part of the world which is where I've done most of my research the southern border of the Sahara again the people there's no such thing as white Africans and then black Africans. There are a whole bunch of brown Africans and tan Africans, you know? And they are from this region of Africa and they've been that way for 2,000 years. It wouldn't be fair to say, oh, you're tan because you have Arab influence. No, that's who they are. Their ethnic group was actually created from the encounter uh, of those uh, communities. It's so ironic that this is called the Sahel, which means coast. The coast. It's the coast of the desert. That's right. The coast of the ocean. That's right. It's the really coast of the amazing. desert. That's right. So, so these groups also look different because they are a mixture of Berbers, Arabs, and other kind of Africans. When I went to Ghana, it was a very matter-of-fact thing. People would call you to get, you know, in a, in a market or whatever, a Bruni, a Bruni, white person. Yes, I do. They don't come buy my stuff. And it was just like to single you out because they wanted you to buy their product or whatever. It wasn't a big deal. That's true, yeah. <laughs> okay, I will uh, stop there. And we'll Thank see you, you so much. Thank you.